OK, so hello and welcome to the educators workshop um, for, the for the Dynamic Dreamscapes project. Today we're going to be giving you some information about the Dynamic Dreamscapes project itself um, and alongside some an introduction to sand dunes and why they're so important to conserve. From there, we'll be able to show you some of the resources that we've got available to educators through our website. Um, which we hope you'll be able to use to engage your classes on the importance of protecting these delicate habitats, but also so you can get out there and enjoy them for yourselves. So Dynamic Dunescapes is actually a partnership project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, the EU Life Programme and various project partners, uh, including Natural England, Plant Life, National Trust, Natural Resources Wales and the Wildlife Trusts. So a little bit of an introduction about the project itself. The aim of the project is to restore sand dunes across sites from Cornwall to Cumbria, all for the benefit of wildlife, people and communities. As engagement officers, we've done a lot of this work with schools, local groups, volunteers, visitors of all ages, um, yeah, as part of the engagement work that we're doing here in Sefton. So there are several project sites between Cornwall and Cumbria. It's working on restoring nine key dune areas, which you can see highlighted on this map. The work at each of the sites is led by one or two of the Project 7 partners here on the Sefton coast, uh, that's Natural England and our neighbours at Formby and National Trust. Um, the areas make up to 34 individual dune sites and cover 7,000 hectares. So why are sand dunes important? Well, they provide a sanctuary for endangered plants and species, endangered plants and animals, which are all perfectly adapted to live in the naturally shifting sand. Species like petalwort are only found in the damp dune slacks, for example. You can see that bottom right photo there, that is petalwort. The dunes are also a really good natural coastal defence. They protect us from flooding and the worst of stormy winds. So they'll have a really important role to play as big weather events increase due to climate change. And of course, we know that they're a really popular place for summer holidays. So part of our work is to make sure that they continue to be enjoyed responsibly. So sand dunes are at risk for various reasons. Um, expert advice on conserving sand dunes has actually changed in recent years. So new conservation and management strategies are needed. Past management techniques have resulted in overstabilized dunes. And as they become overgrown with veg vegetation, the bare sand that healthy dune wildlife need to thrive becomes limited and their natural dynamic processes are impeded. They're listed as a habitat most at risk in Europe for biodiversity loss and sand dune areas are actually shrinking. There's only 20,000 hectares that remain in England and Wales, and that's just half the area of the Isle of Wight, so very small. Not only have previous management techniques caused this overstabilization, but the changing climate has also contributed. Nitrogen deposition from rainfall enriches the soil, which encourages rapid growth of invasive species, and um, namely Japanese rose here on the Sefton coast. So it's really important that we intervene. So this is a little bit about sand dune ecology here. The diagram that you can see demonstrates the natural dune formation, and it's what we call the successional stages of sand dunes. It helps us to understand a little bit more about the stabilisation process that I previously mentioned and why that's so bad for dune health. So sand dunes actually form with the youngest part of the dunes starting on the beach. Classically, this is towards the back of the beach behind the strand line. The dune formation starts to happen when waves push sand up onto the beach. The sand is then picked up by wind and blown around. If there are any obstacles on the beach, the sand becomes trapped. Um, and as this process continues, the layers of trapped sand start to build up, and that is what creates a sand dune. So to convert that diagram into what it, that's likely to look like in real life, um, there's some photos here to demonstrate. You can see in the first image, the windblown sand moving across the beach and couch or lime grass can trap the sand, which then creates embryo dunes. These are often only present in summer and high tides can wash them away, although they do come back. So moving further inland, the dunes eventually become more fixed due to denser vegetation cover from species like marron grass, although there are still areas of bare sand in these parts. Then dune slacks, they're actually low-lying areas within the dune system. 
So where the areas are actually low enough to meet the water table, fresh water pools actually form there. And especially species like the natterjack toad use these pools for breeding. So they're really important. Beyond there, you might find June heath, which is a really rare habitat and it's found on more acidic sand areas. And you'll find several species of heather and lichen here. From there, the dune system graduates into scrub and woodland. So specifically on the Sefton coast, the sand dunes extend for around 20 kilometres between Liverpool and Southport, and that makes it the largest sand dune system in England. It's recognised as one of the most important dune habitats in northwest Europe, and it's a designated site of special scientific interest as well. Other designations include special area of conservation, special protection area and Ramsar, and these actually all guide the work that we do. Sefton supports lots of dune specialised species, such as the sand lizard, natterjack toad, petalwort, and the northern dune tiger beetle, which is actually thought to be the fastest beetle in the world, so it's really cool that we have those here. Our work on the Sefton coast covers around 4,500 hectares of sand dunes, beach and tidal mud flats, and some areas of heath and woodland as well. So some of the work that we've been doing as part of the Dynamic Dunes project um, is slack rejuvenation, which is done where slacks have become overgrown with scrub and are then unsuitable for natterjack toads. Natterjacks are actually really fussy, so they like very shallow pools, not too deep, um, and not too much vegetation cover either. We've also been creating notches in the frontal dunes. These are essentially V-shaped gaps in those frontal dunes, uh, which are put in to encourage more windblown sand to move into the dune system. We hope that by doing this, it will create opportunity of connectivity that will encourage sand lizard populations and natterjack toads to spread throughout the dunes. So the photos that you can see here show what that windblown sand looks like and, and what it, the impact it has on the dunes. The bottom right photo, you can see the sand literally blowing across the beach. The top right photo is a really good demonstration of how the sand scours its way through into the dunes from the notches that we've created. We've also been doing a lot of work on invasive species control. As I mentioned earlier, um, Japanese rose is a real problem here. It likely started as a, just a few plants back in the 70s, but it's now over six hectares. It's really, it overshadows all other specialised dune species, so it's very, it outcompetes other species that we have here. It's really important that we remove that, creates more patches of bare sand as well. And as you might be able to tell, a lot of the work that we're doing here does create more bare sand in the end, which is favoured by all the species within the dunes. Um, and even what we refer to as disturbance, like downtrodden ground by grazers and humans, is a great thing for encouraging this bare sand. So public access is really important as well. I'm going to hand over to Natalie now and she'll be able to talk to you a little bit more about some of the engagement work we've been doing on the project and also the resources that we have available to you on our website. So hello everyone and as Charlotte was saying I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the engagement work that we've been doing on the coast. So I started the project um, in March 2020 so straight into uh, lockdown and Covid world so it was a very strange time for starting engagement but we have been able to do a lot of really cool stuff. So we've been going into care homes um, and taking a reminiscence box there and taking the beach to people who wouldn't necessarily be able to get out on the beach, talking about their memories and having just a nice little day with them, really. We've done a lot of volunteer training and putting on walks for the public and some training for the public, trying to encourage people to get to know and love the sand dunes as much as we do. And then we've done over the summer, did some art workshops, again, encouraging people from different backgrounds into the sand dunes to see how much they might enjoy them and get on with them. So we did some workshops that were aimed at adults. And then over the summer, we also did some family friendly arty workshops, which went really well. We've done a lot of work with dog owners using a dog pledge and branded dog bandanas. And that is looking at, as Charlotte mentioned, encouraging people to use our sand dunes responsibly. And then we've been doing some work with community groups. 
So we've had a totem pole carved from wood here and we've had different community groups coming out to help us paint it. And I've also been working on some interpretation boards for a piece of land called the Triangle. And Freshfield, uh, Freshfield Primary School has come out to help me do some designs for that. So engagement is really important. It's really important that people know what we're doing, understand why, but also that people love and enjoy their dunes as much as we do. And going forward into the future, they can help us look after them. Now let's have a look at what some of our resources are. So we are coming to the end of the project and starting to look at legacy. And that is where these workshops have come from. Um, and we want to share some of the resources that we've put together over the past three years. So we've got our website there. And when you go onto this website, onto the schools part of it, you can see our primary school sand dune activity booklet an introduction to sand dunes, which are the lesson PowerPoint presentations. We've got a dune battle on there, which is like a top trumps um, game. We've also got some species ID guides on there as well, along with lots of other resources. And the John Muir is on here as well, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So let's have a little look at the learning activity booklet. This is really nice. Um, you can download it. It's got some nice information in there. Um, but it's also got some activities. So this activity book has been designed to inspire you to take your pupils out into the sand dunes. The activities are linked to the curriculum, which you can see there. So they're linked to geography, science, art, maths and English. And they are encouraged, the activities encourage pupils to get active and explore the dunes as a dune explorer. The logbook is designed to be printed out and it can be folded into an A5 booklet or as A4 to go onto a clipboard. So the logbook is designed so that it can be referred to, but also written on, annotated, drawn, whatever your um, pupils want to do. Some of the activities in there include spotting different leaves to have a look at the different adaptations on the dunes, looking for different habitats, and matching the animals to their food. There's also a really fun activity that I love on there about trying to make your own uh, sand dune by blowing at the sand and sticking little things into the sand as well. So it's a great little um, activity booklet like that. And hopefully it'll have lots of activities in there that you will find useful as well as the curriculum links. Uh, when you're on our website, you can download a presentation. So these presentations are designed as kind of like the beginnings um, and intro to the sand dunes before you take uh, your students out onto the dunes. They are linked um, to the curriculum. So for year one science, they're linked to identifying, naming and comparing common animals and uh, identifying and naming a variety of common plants. And then for year uh, two, they go into a little bit um, more depth. Uh, so that's for key stage one and then for key stage two again goes into a little bit um, more depth you um, the presentations are really nice they're really um, informative full of lots of different photos they are um, kind of dev and heavy at the moment but there will be some more ones going on specifically for the Sefton coast and this little guy that you can see on here is um, Sebastian the uh, uh, sand lizard and he's there to take you through some of the lessons on there. So for key stage two there are curriculum links to science, history and geography. Another resource that we've got on the uh, website is the June Art Challenge. So this was something that did come along out of Covid and we wanted to connect people to the dunes while we couldn't get out but I think it is really good and some really nice activities um that you can use with your pupils so we've got things like painting a dunescape um salt door creatures you can make a flapping origami butterfly um and you can also make colorful dune dragons and a wriggly caterpillar so there's some really nice little activities on there they are designed to be as low resource as possible um we wanted them to be things that people had around anyway so you you should have everything um that you need already Um, so another thing that we can support you with um, at the June, 
uh, Dynamic Dreamscapes is the John Muir Award. Now, I really love the John Muir Award. So what is it? It's an environmental award scheme which um, helps people connect with, enjoy and care for wild places. The reason I love it is because it's non-competitive, inclusive and accessible, really adaptable. You can make it be whatever you want. It really, really is really adaptable. So how did the John Muir Award come about? So it was created by the John Muir Trust to keep his memory alive and help compete, uh, help connect people to nature. So John Muir was really interested in connecting people with nature, really understood the well-being benefits of being in nature long before anybody else did. So he is actually known as the father of the National Parks Movement in America, and he was a very cool guy. It was around about like the 1800s. He went blind at one point and still went out, still tried to find out about nature using his other senses, smell, hearing and touch. Um, he tied himself to a tree in the middle of a storm and he went camping with a president in one of the future uh, national parks. So he is real, a really cool guy. So we're going to uh, watch a video now. So I am just going to stop sharing my screen. As that video uh, was telling you, there are four challenges that you need to um, complete for the John Muir Award. They are do something to discover a wild place, do something to explore it, do something to conserve it, and then share what you've been doing. And also in there, just sprinkled a little bit of learning about who John Muir was, again, to keep his um, memory alive. There are three levels to the awards. Um, here at Dino Juice we help you with the Discovery Award. So that is 25 hours or four whole days spent on the award. But as I say, the award is really adaptable. So you can spread those 25 hours however you want amongst these four challenges. 
You could do a really big share project and spend lots of time making a really nice art project, sharing what you've done to discover your wild place or explore it. Um, or you could do a really big conservation uh, project. Maybe you could talk to us or one of the other partners along the coast and come out and do a really big conservation project. It is entirely up to you. Or you can split those hours evenly across um, each of the four challenges. It is up to you what you and your pupils want to do. And that is one of the reasons why I really love the John Muir Award. There aren't any tests for the award. Everyone who completes it gets a certificate. All you have to do is make sure you are completing those four challenges and spending the right amount of hours on the award. Now, to help you with um, the award, we have actually created the June Discovery booklet, um, which is a really nice booklet, similar to the um, the what the other one I was telling you about. Um, but it's got some really nice activities in here, um, really nice little activities. And these are all based on those four challenges. So they've all been designed to help you tick off those challenges. They're really nice, um, really fun activities. There are quite a lot of links to the curriculum with them. Some of the activities include climbing to the top of the dune and seeing what you can see from that dune, identifying different animal tracks. There's food chains in there to fill in. There's some little beach art activities that you can do. And there are also some ideas for your sharing activities. So we've tried to make it as easy as possible for you and give you as many ideas as we can for completing the award. Now, how do you complete the award? So um, you go onto our website, which I will show you in a minute, and you can download the June Discovery Activity Booklet, which you can use as a journal and tick off what activities you've been doing if you want. And what you need to do is fill in the proposal form and you do need to sign up to the award before you start doing the activities. John Muir are very clear about that. They don't particularly like um, people doing the activities and then signing up for the award. They like to know what you're doing best. So you get your proposal form. We've tried to make it as easy as possible. So all the activities that are in the booklet are on the proposal form. So you can just tick off what activities you feel like doing. I don't tick them all off. Because I know full well that you're not going to be able to do all of them. Uh, so do have a little look and see which ones you think you might want to do. Once you have, send that completed form back to us. And then it's time for you to go and do your activities. Again, use the activity pack as a journal if you want. And then when you've finished all the tasks, I'm going to go back onto the website and get the certificate request form. It's where you fill in all the students' names and there's a little bit of statistics on there. Um, but there is also a four challenge review form included on that and that just lets us know what you've been up to so you don't have to go into loads of detail but just very briefly you can say how you've met each of those um challenges and that just helps us make sure that everyone is doing what they said and that everyone is fitting those um challenges and spending the right amount of hours on the award and once you've done that uh, send that back to us and then we'll arrange for the certificates to come out to you. So that is the John Muir Award. We'll just have a little look at what other resources we've got and then I will show you on the website where you can find some of these. So we've got, as I mentioned, some of the uh, species ID sheets on there that you can download and have a look at. We've got the June Battle, which is like a top trumps, but we've also got some colouring sheets on there got some little facts about sand dunes on there as well that you can download. We've got a word search um, on there and we've also got some worksheets like ingredients for a sand dune. So we've got some really nice stuff that we really hope will be of interest and be useful for you. So let's have a little look at where we find those. So we're just going to have a little look at our website. So when you go onto our website down at junescapes.co.uk, this is what you see, our landing page, lovely uh, information on there. But to get to school resources, you want to go across to get involved and down to schools. And then when you scroll down, you've got our educational and learning resources. You've got the primary school sand dune activity book, which you can download in English and Welsh if you want to. And that looks like this. So you can download it. It's got introduction and how to use it, the curriculum links. 
um, and then it's got loads of information here for you and then it starts going into the activities. So it is a really nice um, activity booklet for you. And then when you go down next, this is where all the presentations are with the accompanying lesson notes as well for you. Um, and then this is going into some of the um, key stage three and four, but here's the uh, the June battle that you can download. We've got some fact files and case studies that you can have a little look at. This is uh, Dorset, sorry, this is Studland Bay um, resources, but there will be some uh, Sefton Coast ones going there as well. Got some ID guides there. Um, and to get onto the John Muir Award, you want to go again to get involved and to families. And that is where we've got our Sand Spy activity box, 30 things to do in the dunes there. Um, and you can go. You can go to um, the John Muir Award. That gives you a little bit more information again about what the award involves, who can get involved. Here's the June Discovery booklet that you can download and here are the proposal forms. And then again, that tells you what to do and you can download the certificate request form and send that back to us. So we will be sending the links round for where everything is that you can find them. So I think we'll shop sh stop sharing there. Um, so that is a little, just a little introduction to the Dan at Dunescapes project, a bit of an introduction to sand dune ecology and then just sharing what resources we've got. So I really hope that you have found that useful and that you find the activities um, useful. So thank you for coming and thank you for listening. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see you out on the sand dunes soon.